Hi guys, so I noticed that people are having a lot of trouble filling out the paperwork, and I guess that's um, a result of the fact that this is the first time I've done this project, so I, maybe I haven't made clear exactly what I'm looking for on each page. Maybe I need to change the way I do it for next year. But for right now, we're, we're sort of stuck with this form. So let me explain to you what I'm looking for in each of the first three questions that you see on the first page. I think most people did an okay job with number one. What is your team trying to prove? Well, either you're trying to prove a chemical change happened or you're trying to prove that there's reasonable doubt about whether or not a chemical change happened. And where people started to get confused, and including me, was with numbers two and three. So number two says, what types of evidence will conclusively prove your point? And it has the word types in it. What types of evidence? It doesn't say what evidence will conclusively prove. It says what types of evidence, which means that this is a question about, in general, what kinds of evidence do you go looking for whenever you're trying to decide whether a change is chemical or physical? And the answer to this question is really in the notes that I gave you on chemical and physical changes. I've given you in a couple of different places a list of things that you should be looking for to help you determine conclusively whether or not a change is chemical. And you really only need to list two of them, but if you can come up with a third one, that's great. But these should be very general things. And what I saw for a lot of people in this area was that you wrote things like, um, the, a new gas was formed or um, water appeared at the top of the test tube. Those things are specific to the baking soda lab and not types of evidence. Those are evidence specifically from this lab. So I don't want that. I want in general what do you need to do in order to prove that a chemical change has, has or has not happened. Then in number three, what types of evidence will support but not prove your point? This is where I want you to list the types of evidence, again, types, right? The types of evidence in general from those notes that you can use to suggest that a chemical change has or has not happened, but that are not proof positive. So for example, things like a color change could indicate that a chemical change has happened, but it's not conclusive. So this is the kind of thing that would go in number three. Then down at number four, which I didn't actually write on here, it asks you to f complete this sentence. This is a case about. It's about what? What's the big idea of your case? Now, this is where you want to get a little bit poetic, not just scientific-y. You want to think to yourself, okay, if I were going to present this case to a jury, what's the story that I'm trying to tell? It should be more than just a story about chemical and physical change, because to make it interesting to a jury, you kind of want to add some kind of human element, which is hard, of course, in the case of chemicals, but you know, this is where you want to get a little bit creative if you can. This is a case about what? What is it that you want the jury to be thinking about as you're presenting your case? Okay guys, so for your opening statement, you want to tell a story to the court. Basically, you're going to be telling this story to the jury and the judge, and what you want to do is you want to present the case in a conversational way that lets everybody know right from the beginning what it is you're trying to prove and how you're going to prove it. Now, when you look at my story, which I made up about you know, Mr. Zinc be going through chemical or physical change, You'll notice that, for the most part, I'm telling it in what I call chronological order. So I'm kind of taking you through the steps in my own thinking. So here's kind of the breakdown of my opening statement. First, I give you my theory of the case. I tell you that my theory of what's going on here is that Mr. Zink did not go through a chemical change and that the prosecution thinks he went through a chemical change because they ran faulty experiments. So I didn't just tell you, hey, this is not a chemical change. I told you, I gave you a, a reason why the prosecution might think otherwise. In other words, I didn't just present my argument. I talked a little bit about the fact that the other side has an argument, but hey, they're wrong. So that's my theory of the case. And that's kind of the whole three or four sentences at the beginning. Then I state at the very end of that what my position is. My position is that Mr. Zink is innocent. There's no evidence that he went through a chemical change. And then the rest of the argument is all about the evidence I have to support that claim. And I go into a, a lot of different areas here. 
since my, the theory of the case is about the other side not running a valid experiment and doing things improperly, that's what I focus my attention on. So knowing what your theory of the case is will help you develop your evidence. So my theory of the case is that, hey, this is not a chemical change. Any evidence to the contrary is because the prosecution is just all messed up. They don't know how to run a fair test. So you can kind of see me making that argument throughout my opening statement. And that's kind of what you want to do. You want to make your opening statement tell a clear story of what you think is really going on. Okay, so take a look at the rubric with me for the chemical trial sheets. So up at the top, presentation, pretty straightforward. You know, make sure your work is proofread, it's organized, it flows. But supporting details, take a look at this. Really understand what each one of these elements is because they're 10 points apiece. First of all, I need to see from your opening statement that your case is built from specific examples and evidence that logically supports the ideas presented and there should be multiple pieces of evidence that are selected. Take a minute, go through my opening statement, find the specific examples of evidence and note how many different pieces I use. For the second one, explanations and descriptions of lab tests, many students neglected to do this. Go through my opening statement and find the places where I gave explanations and descriptions of lab tests that were conducted. The third one, arguments made by the opposition, that's the other team, right? If you're prosecution, that means the defense. If you're the defense, that means the prosecution. Arguments made by the opposition are included and countered according to the team's theory of the case. So I should see either in your um, opening statement or in your cross-examination sheet references to the other team's theory of the case and how you're going to counter that. And then observations from the lab. This would be things like, what did you see when you did the splint test? What did you um, see when you did the test with the phenothaline, the, the pH test, things like that. What did you see during the heating process itself? Go through my opening statement and find the places where I mention those things. Now, for higher level thinking, here are some things I'm looking for. And this comes really mostly from your actual um, filling in of the forms, the first one. You need to understand the difference between conclusive evidence and circumstantial evidence. I brought this up in the tutorial that I did before we started this project, and I also have it in the notes that I've given you and in the, um, yeah, in the notes and in that tutorial. Those are the two places. So conclusive evidence and circumstantial evidence are distinguished on that first sheet. The first three things that you're going to write down are conclusive evidence and then the rest are circumstantial. Some of you are pretty confused about that. I see people making claims that, oh, this is, this is um, conclusive evidence of a chemical change and the thing that you're saying is evidence of a chemical change is not conclusive. So make sure you understand the difference between conclusive and circumstantial evidence. The other thing that a lot of students neglected is that I should get a sense from this that you understand how to conduct a valid experiment. If you're the prosecution, this is going to come up in you defending your lab tests. Did you do things the way you were supposed to? Did you have control groups? Did you keep everything constant? Did you run multiple tests? Things like that. Or if you didn't do those things, do you at least realize you should have? And then the defense should be bringing up whether or not something is valid, mainly as an attack, right? Just like in my opening statement, I attacked the validity of the test that the prosecution ran. And that's basically the heart of my case is, hey, you can't trust them because they made mistakes and errors. And I was specific about what I thought those errors would be. Then the next one shows understanding of the evidence needed to conclusively determine the type of change that occurred. This is very similar to the first one where you distinguish between conclusive and circumstantial evidence. Here, in your opening statement, I really need to see that you understand what it takes to come to a, a definite conclusion about whether or not the change is physical or chemical. So you need to know what are the key things that make it conclusive. The next one is evidence is used accurately and effectively to build a case that is logical. Don't make mistakes in building your case. Don't tell me that something happened that doesn't happen. 
I saw a lot of people do this in their physical and chemical changes labs. When I looked at your archives, I had people write down that, you know, oh, um, this turned yellow or this thing, you know, um, gave off a gas. And I would say to myself, but that doesn't happen. So that, you know, make sure that you're accurately describing what happened and that you know what happened. Um, and that way you can effectively use your evidence. If you don't really understand what happened during the lab, you really can't. And then finally, I'm going to judge whether or not I think you have um, overcome or established reasonable doubt. If you're the prosecution, then you should be proving your case beyond a reasonable doubt that a chemical change happened. If you are the defense, you should be throwing reason reasonable doubt out there all over the place so that I'm at the end going, well, maybe it isn't a chemical change. I'm just not sure anymore. Make sure that you understand each element of the rubric so that you can go looking for these things before you turn in your final project. So your whole group needs to look over the stuff. And maybe you want to assign a person to look for each of these different elements of supporting details and higher level thinking. You can always get higher level thinking points back if you make a mistake there. But everything on the top of this rubric, the other 50 points, you have to get that right the first time. So make sure you know what the elements of supporting details are. Make sure that you know how to do a good job with your writing. Okay, and that's it. I'll see you guys in class.